I think we can get started. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Christine Schmidt and I'm the Deputy Director and Head of Research at the Wiener Holocaust Library in London. On behalf of the library, we're really delighted to welcome you to tonight's event and to welcome Dr. Bastian Willems, who will present findings from his new book, Violence in Defeat, the Wehrmacht on German Soil, 1944 to 1945. In the final year of the Second World War, as bitter defensive fighting moved to German soil, a wave of intra-ethnic violence engulfed the country. Willems offers the first study into the impact and behavior of the Wehrmacht on its own territory, focusing on the German units fighting in East Prussia and its capital, Königsberg. He shows that the Wehrmacht's retreat into Germany after three years of brutal fighting on the Eastern Front contributed significantly to the spike of violence, which occurred throughout the country immediately prior to defeat. Soldiers arriving with an, in, with an ingrained arborized mindset developed on the Eastern Front shaped the immediate environment of the area of operations and of Nazi Germany as a whole. Willems established how the norms of the Wehrmacht as a retreating army impacted behavioral patterns on the home front, arguing that, this, that its presence increased the propensity to carry out violence in Germany. Now, before I introduce our speaker, just a few notes of housekeeping. You'll be kept on mute throughout the entire lecture but we'll save time at the end to take as many questions as we can. So please feel free to put those in the chat at any time and we will feed those back to uh, Dr. Willems. And we are also recording tonight's session, but your camera won't appear on screen. So um, if you also, if you miss part of the, of the lecture, please feel free to find it on our YouTube channel not long after. We are also using automated captioning for those who need it. You can toggle that on and off at the bottom of your screen. And just to note that it is automated, and so sometimes it doesn't accurately reflect what the speaker is saying, but we will try to, of course, endeavor to clarify any questions you might have. Um, and finally, if you have any technical issues, please feel free to send me a direct message or my colleague, Martina, and we will try our best to help. So without further ado, now to our speaker. Dr. Bastian Dillens is a Leverhulme Broad Fellow at the Ludwig Maximilians Universität in Munich. Formerly, formerly, he was a postdoctoral research fellow of modern European history at University College London, our neighbor uh, at, at the library. So I would like to hand the virtual floor over to Baz. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Christine. Uh, I'd say without further ado, I'll just get immediately into the, into the PowerPoint presentation and any questions. Uh, I'm really looking forward to them. So uh, yeah, please, uh, please put them in a the chat. There we go. And sure. Can everyone see it? If maybe if Christine can confirm. Looks good. Okay, good. There. So what I'm focusing on today is a uh, uh, is a part of my uh, uh, of my research. Uh, obviously, given that the uh, focus of the of the library is on the Holocaust and genocide, that is what I. Um, tailored this, uh, this talk uh, towards. So what I want to be looking at is, uh, is that how the genocidal mindset of the Eastern Front, how this shaped intra-ethnic violence uh, on German soil in 1945. So the purpose of this talk, um, and this is already what uh, uh, Christine noted, is like just to tie the fighting of the Eastern Front, uh, which happened between 1941 and 1944, uh, closer to the fighting on German soil in 1944 and 1945, and show that as soldiers developed uh, like an Eastern Front mindset, if you will, uh, during their stay in the Soviet Union, this permanently altered behavioral patterns that would also impact uh, the fighting during the defense of, uh, of Germany. So now, why do I find this important? So now the fighting uh, in the Soviet Union, and the fighting in Germany uh, share many of the same actors, of course, notably the army and the SS. Uh, but despite their obvious presence uh, on home soil during the violence in Germany, uh, it's awfully, uh, often mainly explained as being caused by uh, uh, the radicalized party member, sort of like the linchpin of, uh, of, of violence. So uh, put differently, uh, even though the army and the SS uh, were at the center of mass violence in the, uh, in the Soviet Union, these actors are hardly considered when it uh, concerns uh, the spike of intra-ethnic violence uh, in Germany in, in 1945. And with intra-ethnic violence, I mean German versus German violence. Um, so the fighting in Germany um, uh, was part of a very long series of battles uh, for, uh, for the German soldier. 
So this is why I choose here this picture. This is um, um, uh, taken in in Rostov. So you go uh, like around Rostov. So you can imagine and you should uh, uh, keep in mind, of course, that um, many German soldiers, the hardened veterans, uh, for them, uh, this was basically just uh, the last of a very long series uh, of uh, defensive battles. Um, so they would see that uh, continuity. And if you were ever to look at um, uh, memoirs from that time or uh, divisional um, uh, uh, diaries, war diaries from the war, uh, they tend to be called something along the lines of like um, division such and such uh, from 1941 until 1945. There isn't a, a clear break, obviously, in 1944. Uh, this is more like an historiographical uh, divide. So all that being said, uh, this is why I think we should actively uh, consider the role of the Wehrmacht on, on soil. So the structure of this talk. So the first part deals with the ways in which this Eastern Front mindset developed between 1941 and 1944. Now, I think this is uh, familiar to some, if not most of you, uh, but I do find it necessary to flag up some of the issues connected to the defensive fighting in the Soviet Union uh, that also manifest themselves during the defensive fighting in Germany. So here we have a map so that we can uh, situate uh, the area that I'm focusing on. So this is East Prussia here. It uh, attached uh, parts uh, during uh, the Nazi rule. Here the same uh, East Prussia, but just uh, now situated uh, as part of Germany. Uh, so the second part uh, shows uh, where we find proof uh, of this changed mindset during the fighting in uh, 1944, 1945. So focusing on the continuities and behavioral patterns among the Wehrmacht, the attitudes to evacuation, attitudes to the civilians, total war, and uh, attitudes to morality and uh, law. Now, if you think, why don't I know the province uh, is Prussia? Well, this is obviously fairly Obviously, it no longer uh, exists today. It's divided between Poland, Russia, the Oblast Kaliningrad, and Lithuania in the north. So Memo is today, for example, the city of Klaipeda, and Königsberg is the city of Kaliningrad. So now we start with the, the Eastern Front uh, mindset. And here I'm just going to be very brief, if only because tomorrow we're going to have a very good talk by Alex K, who will do this much, much better. Uh, so. We start, of course, with the criminal orders of 1941, um, and this, uh, like how this changes the, the attitudes towards uh, genocide. So you see already that German soldiers really start to behave very differently towards uh, their uh, direct environment and the people uh, living uh, in it. Most uh, important, uh, especially with uh, what I'm uh, talking about today, is. Uh, is a deep distrust of the population and fear of partisans. We'll turn to this uh, shortly. Uh, there's incredibly strict discipline in case of uh, in case of uh, uh, defeatism. Of course, on the other hand, uh, German soldiers uh, are allowed to vent uh, their anger and frustration on their uh, direct uh, environment. Uh, so we have incredibly high casualty numbers on the one hand, and Kameradschaft uh, based. Uh, around uh, like this, this core unit and a sense of hyper masculinity. I see that at Westermann is uh, in the crowd. So and drinking bouts, as you see here. Um, uh, on the other hand, and in the middle, you have a picture of uh, a geese being uh, uh, taken out of the yeah, out of the local population. And in the left, uh, you see uh, pictures of the uh, Red Army soldiers who um, yeah, most of them, as we all know, uh, were to be uh, killed soon thereafter. So now uh, to the attitude towards uh, civilians. So um, in 1941 and from 1941 onwards, you see that uh, Soviet civilians are uh, used as a, as a labor force. We're talking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of uh, Soviet uh, civilians are used as, uh, as, as laborers or forced laborers. So in the Wehrmacht, uh, the German military had to draft massive numbers of uh, Soviet uh, civilians um, to basically help with uh, auxiliary tasks. Uh, quite famously, uh, they are also helped to combat partisans. Um, and here uh, we talk a little bit about that. So 
And what the Wehrmacht soon realizes, uh, or like members of the Wehrmacht soon realize, is that um, the Soviets are truly uh, fighting a, a total war and they will actively use civilians in the defense uh, of their cities. So, for example, at Leningrad, you have massive uh, uh, mil uh, militias that are being supported, and they know of this. They know that at Kursk, two years later, uh, civilians uh, dig a series of defensive positions that is basically unrivaled at that point, and that really changes uh, uh, the course uh, of the war. Partisans, of course, truly disrupt uh, the German rear areas and much manpower has to be allocated to combat them. So a lot of German soldiers now uh, have to perform tasks with which they uh, uh, are unfamiliar with or um, uh, which they didn't know they would, uh, would, be, would be performing. So uh, this extends well beyond uh, uh, like a, the distrust that emerges uh, is well beyond just a man of fighting age. But basically, everyone who's considered uh, uh, capable of helping partisans, which is effectively everyone. So what does this mean? Um, there, is, uh, there starts to emerge, let's say, a begrudging respect for the Soviet enemy. So and just the awareness, really, that civilians can change the course of the war. And this is what uh, exactly what happens in, uh, uh, in the Soviet Union. Now, here we are in uh, 1943. So at, at this point, like the first uh, uh, losses are, uh, have, uh, of course, uh, occurred uh, between late 1941 and uh, 1943. And from 1943, of course, sort of a, a permanent uh, retreat uh, sets in, if you will. So, of course, um, this... Uh, uh, what, what takes place is uh, in, in retreat, you see massive scorched earth uh, policies. Now, of course, this doesn't necessarily violate the rules of war. Um, and here, like uh, as I put it, so as long as the ultimate intention is just unavoidable spillage of war, such as the death of civilians or destruction of crops, ought not to be condemned. So, uh, of course, as we all know, um, this is not what happens in, in, in the final years uh, of, the, of the Wehrmacht stay on the, on the Eastern Front. Uh, in fact, the scale of scorched earth is unparalleled. It far exceeds uh, any, mis uh, uh, any rationale. Uh, it uh, far exceeds depriving uh, the opposing military of the means of continuing to fight. And uh, as you see here in this picture, it's not uncommon for soldiers to express, let's say, pleasure or some pride in it. So, uh, of course, also in 1943, 1944, um, uh, you see again sort of like a spike in, uh, in acts of genocide. So the retreat offers sort of like a final opportunity to deal with uh, those people that have long opposed Nazi rule. So as a way to get rid of useless eaters. So you see large-scale evacuations, you see deportations, uh, both of goods and civilians. Now, all of this really doesn't change uh, the self-image of, of most soldiers, although there are some soldiers that reflect on their behavior. But by and large, given that they uh, feel that they are acting in, uh, in a way in which military necessity uh, is uh, being adhered to, they, uh, most of them, the vast majority, uh, considers themselves to be a decent, uh, decent soldiers. Now, uh, now we move to, uh, not, uh, to German soil in the, um, in the second half of 1944. And what I wanted to start with here is uh, what remains in place, because what we tend to do is we tend to focus on, on, on the differences, but I think it is important to, to stress what remains the same. And of course, uh, to start with, it's the entire German military structure, like the entire organizational structure remains in place. Of course, uh, divisions have been absolutely, absolutely battered, uh, have been really uh, bled dry in, in many occasions, but still uh, there maintains a, a core of seasoned veterans. And normally it's around these, set, uh, around these veterans uh, that you, you build your, uh, your, your division. So young uh, recruits or 
old recruits at some point, of course, uh, they will look up to these veterans um, and style their uh, behavior um, accordingly. So um, also very important is that once back uh, on German soil, uh, soldiers were not told uh, to change their behavior. Um, they were not expected to do so. Uh, since they fought, they were acted, uh, acting decently. Uh, they didn't feel the need to do so. So you have this truly warped sense of military necessity as, uh, the, uh, as the Wehrmacht moves back on German soil. So what we have here, and, and these are, of course, the ideas of, of Ian Kershaw that I'm um, paraphrasing here and using here, uh, is the idea that the most radical idea would be uh, the most uh, appreciated up the chain of command. And this is what you see uh, still as the German military retreats uh, into, into East Prussia. So German soldiers, they consider themselves to be the ones who know the proper use of violence, uh, which means, as we will see in a, in a short while, uh, this also allows them to disregard the civilian concerns and the objections that they, uh, that they very often voiced. What also, of course, does not change is the enemy in front of the German soldier, which remains, of course, the, the Red Army. What this means is the motivations to fight, uh, these do not change. Uh, so the attitudes towards genocide, they don't have to change. So propaganda sticks to the same themes. So here we see uh, on the right, we see a poster dated that, uh, February 1945. This is after um, German troops have broken out of, of Königsberg. I will spare you the operational uh, details, but long story short, an area is uh, reconquered. Here, um, German soldiers find proof, so to speak, of uh, crimes of, uh, of the Judeo-Bolsheviks, and they will um, attach a, uh, uh, yeah, like a campaign, sort of like a very classical uh, campaign that we have also seen in, in the earlier years where sort of like this uh, Judeo-Bolshevik stereotype, in this case, a skeleton with a knife between his teeth, uh, um, killing a emaciated uh, German woman. So, of course, uh, this is unfortunately all things we have, we have seen before. So that also means that acts of genocide are still being committed uh, at this point by a deeply implicated military apparatus. So still you see that Soviet uh, soldiers are being uh, executed on the spot. Uh, Polish uh, prisoners of war um, in Königsberg, they are treated as a, like a sort of a fifth column, of course. So they really, the, German, the Germans in, in Königsberg, um, they truly believe that, okay, they, they could really uh, like attack them uh, in the back, uh, if you will. So they are looked at with deep, deep suspicion. So um, the same applies to like auxiliaries that uh, auxiliary um, uh, Soviet uh, civilians often who have retreated back with the German army uh, onto German soil. They are now um, uh, looked at with deep, deep suspicion uh, as more support turns uh, against uh, the, German, uh, the German soldier. And of course, is the defense on home soil gives the German soldiers a sense of urgency. So uh, not only do they find all their negative uh, stereotypes and everything that they have been fed by propaganda uh, to be confirmed, it, it now uh, also has this, this urgency what, what they didn't have before. So rather than the, the retreat back uh, into Germany, um, ensuring that the German soldier might alter his behavior uh, and become more uh, like of a gallant standard defensive soldier. Uh, actually, uh, the other uh, end of that, uh, the other side of that coin, you see that there's also a great many soldiers who um, find that this is a reason to, to act even harsher towards their uh, direct uh, environment. Uh, where you see this above all is with two things. And the first uh, of these is, uh, uh, is their attitude towards evacuation. So the main question during evacuation as of February 1943 is like, what is to be evacuated? What is to be left behind? And what is to be destroyed? Uh, this did not change on German soil. The, 
Um, the OKW uh, orders are pretty clear about this. Um, there is no real uh, change uh, in, in that respect. A lot of um, scholars have pointed to the uh, to the quite infamous Nero order uh, of uh, um, uh, March 1945, if I'm not uh, mistaken, which is let's say made famous uh, because it's mentioned in Albert Speer's uh, memoirs. But reading this uh, order, which is really only 250 words, it's a very short uh, order. It really doesn't change uh, a whole lot of what is already uh, in place. It really didn't break much, uh, much new ground in that, uh, uh, in, in that respect. So um, because what's happening as of 1943 is that special units had to ensure, and here I quote, the furthest possible preservation of economic goods and manpower uh, for the German war economy and the weakening of the enemy's war potential through the paralysis and the destruction of production facilities and their products, as well as the transporting of, of manpower. So this remains uh, completely uh, the same uh, as, um, as troops move uh, back uh, into Germany. Uh, so they, uh, they still value uh, uh, goods and in the same way they will uh, transport it off. So in, in East Prussia, you see um, uh, a lot of the agriculture. Uh, East Prussia is an agricultural uh, prov uh, province. So uh, a lot of the, the farms are being broken down uh, really uh, to, to, to their pipes, like nothing, uh, nothing remains of it. Um, uh, you see uh, here in the bottom picture, um, uh, there's a true priority to the, to the evacuation of cattle. Uh, for example, this uh, is uh, most of the times uh, is more important to evacuate the cattle than, uh, than civilians. Now, I know that sounds uh, quite, uh, quite, quite a damning statement, uh, which, you know, of course it is. Um, but what the... Um, the military and the party uh, together realized because there are uh, talks about this at, at the highest level is if you're going to evacuate the German civilians, like where are you going to evacuate them to? Uh, if you are evacuating these Prussians, uh, a lot of them, for example, in the beginning are being sent to Saxony. So Saxony uh, is at this point already quite heavily bombed with, uh, with Dresden, of course, uh, a very famous example. Uh, a lot of others are uh, evacuated to uh, Schleswig-Holstein and to, to Denmark. Now, also these areas are threatened to be overrun by the Americans. So basically, you're bringing uh, German uh, civilians into American captivity. So there is also this sense that it doesn't really, uh, uh, it wouldn't really add up to uh, evacuate uh, German civilians. So they might as well. Uh, stay uh, stay where they are. Now, as I said, there are constant talks about this between the, the German military and uh, party officials. So even that after the war, uh, this is constantly pinned on, on party officials that they, um, uh, that they in, enforce the rules. Uh, it's, they are still in, in constant contact with, with the military uh, about this. So you see this with shipping space, uh, you see this uh, with the use of trains. It is all meant to transport military material, uh, the wounded, of course, troops, uh, then other economic goods. And normally at the very bottom of every list, uh, it will say civilians. But it is very, very clear that this is always uh, an afterthought and can also not be much more than an afterthought. Now, what is the result of this? By the time that the Red Army uh, invades uh, East Prussia uh, uh, en masse, uh, this is uh, during the East Prussian uh, Offensive, which starts on the 12th and the 13th uh, of January 1945. You see that most civilians were completely unprepared. Some of them, of course, know a little bit more uh, than others, so some of them already have their cards uh, prepared, yet others are still completely unprepared. Uh, as I said, uh, the province is an agricultural province, so a lot of farmers have big carts and feel that because they have these carts, it is much easier to, to move out. Of course, this completely clogs up every road. Um, uh, after 
uh, after the start of the offensive. And this means that uh, given that the German military has to use these roads, they are being pushed off or forced to use uh, byways. So uh, the entire uh, province is at this point uh, is uh, uh, on the road and it being January um, in uh, well, like in East uh, Eastern Germany, it means that the temperature sometimes uh, drop to minus 20 uh, degrees. I have no idea what that is in Fahrenheit. It's very, very cold. And um, uh, so a lot of people uh, freeze, to, uh, freeze to death uh, during, this, uh, during this period. Uh, civilians do almost exclusively after the war uh, blame this on, on the party. They blame the party for the lack of evacuation. But as I said, by and large, uh, the party really just follows the, the, the persevere a line of, uh, of the military. So they, they enforce it. Um, so the party is in charge of the evacuation of civilians. But of course, um, almost no resources are allocated to, uh, to evacuation because every um, police officer that uh, could help uh, assisting in the evacuation is also a, a police officer could be looking for stragglers. Every boat um, that has a, a cargo hull, um, this cargo hull would not be used for civilians. Of course, it will be used for uh, the evacuation of wounded and for goods. Uh, a few refugee camps are being set up in, uh, in East Prussia. Again, we look to the party uh, as the main culprit of the fact that it is all going horribly wrong there. So we have a lot of diseases um, in, these, in these camps, uh, like hunger and uh, typhoid. Um, but again, we should keep in mind that this is in the middle of the area of operation. So it's the part, it's the army, sorry, that has the, uh, the final authority there. And it just doesn't allocate any sufficient resources uh, like to them. Now, why is this? Um, uh, this is, um, above all, in my opinion, so this is what I argue in my book, is um, because uh, the army is, is looking back at the way it used civilians and the way it saw civilians used uh, in, in the Soviet Union. So they are very much aware that the Soviets have been fighting a total war since 1941 and that civilians managed to change the tide of the war. So they see, they have to admit, civilians changed uh, the tide of the war. Also, the French in, in the 1790s managed to, uh, to change uh, the tide of the war. So here we have a situation where uh, the two main enemies of Germany, so like the arch nemesis, if you will, uh, they have been uh, able to um, change the course of a war through the use of civilians. Uh, through like a, like a popular uh, elan. And um, Germany can boast no such example. So this is the time uh, perhaps to, to do that. Another very important point, and I think this is uh, uh, known uh, quite a lot better, is the idea of, of the stab in the back. So um, after the First World War, you have the, uh, the German military that really really manages to convince itself that it's not defeated on the battlefield, but has been stabbed in the back by the home front. So you see already in 1943, uh, propaganda minister Goebbels has to start a campaign saying 1918 and 1943, it's not the same. Um, they are very much afraid of being stabbed in the back uh, once more. Now, uh, at this point, you can therefore um, kill two birds with one stone because you now finally give, uh, through the fact that you're defending your own territory, you can give uh, German civilians that chance, so to speak, to, uh, 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 to, to, show their, uh, to show their value. So German civilians are encouraged to defend their own territory. And here we sort of uh, are uh, familiar with the propagandic boasts, so like until the last drop of blood or until the last bullet, whatever you want to call it. Uh, of course, the collateral damage of this all, like both to property and to civilian life, uh, this is no longer uh, a main concern. 
Um, the German army knows that it is fighting. It knows that it has to defend its territory and is now actively uh, using uh, civilians to, uh, to help with that. So uh, here I'm looking at the, the fortress command of Königsberg. We will return to this again uh, briefly, uh, which consists of the party and the army. Uh, it's uh, contrary to uh, what happens to uh, uh, evacuees, people who are on the move through East Prussia. You see that in Königsberg, as long as people promise to stay put or do stay put, uh, food is being arranged for them, uh, shelter is being arranged for them, medical care is being arranged for them. There's even um, the idea that uh, they try to maintain a sense of uh, normality. Cinema remains open. Uh, banks actually reopen stores, uh, uh, extra stores open. So some stores were closed and now reopen. Even the university gives uh, some lectures uh, here and there. And uh, yeah, so they really try in, uh, in Königsberg, which is really a city at, uh, at the full front line for, for uh, over two months to keep the sense of normality. Now, how do they, uh, how did they do that? Um, well, above all, uh, through the use of, uh, of the Volkssturm. Now, the Volkssturm is a people's militia. So these are boys from uh, the age of 16 until men of the age of 60. They are fully deployed uh, in Königsberg, so both young boys and old men. Uh, so here you see a picture. Uh, if you look carefully, you see that these are actually quite old men uh, in that picture. But this is a propaganda picture. It's even, uh, this is original color, so this is not color price or what have you. Uh, so uh, the fact that someone with a color camera comes and shows this as a, a prime example shows how uh, pervasive uh, the use of uh, the elderly is. It's even called, uh, Königsberg is called uh, the fortress of the elderly uh, due to the age of the many uh, older people in there. And then you also have very young um, boys and especially with the young boys, um, uh, you see that they are above all used in uh, offensive operations. And here you truly see how calculated the attitudes of the, uh, uh, of the military are. Because what they do is they hype up these young boys and these young boys, they try to, to prove themselves. They are being used in offensive operations, whereas these old men who feel that they are um, uh, protecting their, their wives and their families and, 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 uh, and longer standing values, these tend to be used in, in the defense. So this is all very much uh, thought out uh, by, the, um, by, the, by the divisions that are uh, in, in Königsberg, and this all serves the purpose of uh, keeping uh, a core of seasoned veterans intact. You don't want to put your best uh, troops, of course, uh, 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 ahead of the fighting. You want to keep those um, yeah, a little bit behind in case you really need them. Uh, another point, very important point, is, uh, is Festungsdienst, or fortress servants, uh, for all civilians. and. As you see here, it is for men, women, and children um, for four hours per day. Now, what does this mean in, in practice? Um, yeah, the Volkssturm units, uh, you don't want your Volkssturm men, of course, to do um, tasks that could be, uh, could be done by someone else. So you have, for example, every Volkssturm unit has a, a sewing room attached to it. So whenever clothes needs to be washed or clothing needs to be patched up or so, like there are a few women doing that. Of course, this all frees up men uh, for the front. Um, women basically um, occupy all the important functions in, in, in the hospital. So uh, again, all with the purpose of freeing up men for the front. Um, we have an account of, of a boy who is asked to pass artillery coordinates and uh, has to use his uh, sled to hold grenades um, or help mine a bridge. Uh, his, his grandfather uh, has to help in a, in a tank um, repair depot in, in, in the city. And again, all this is meant to free up men uh, to to serve uh, to serve on the front, and what the, the commander of uh, uh, of Königsberg tries to create 
uh, this is what he communicates in the, in the newspapers at the time, is to create uh, like a Kampfgemeinschaft, so like a, uh, a fighting or a battle community, or like a Festungsgemeinschaft, so like a community, like a fortress community, where everyone basically with the purpose of you're looking the person in the eye who is defending you and uh, the person defending is to look uh, is just looking to the person he's defending so really uh, you're all depending on on each other now obviously uh, this comes with uh, uh but with, with massive massive uh, downsides to to people who are not used to uh, to this sort of mentality which which are most people like most civilians so the entire city, of course, is put on a martial law, which happens uh, overnight. And this happens on 28th of January when, and, uh, when Königsberg, when the city is, uh, uh, is encircled. Um, it is impossible for civilians to, to adjust to these new laws with which they are completely, completely uh, unfamiliar in, in such a short uh, time. So imagine... Uh, you fleeing as, as an old man, you go into hiding because, of course, you do that. You are a, you know, like, like a 60 year old, 60 year old man or, or young boy. Um, or you go uh, into someone's house to maybe find some food, all these sort of things. These are all very logical things if you're a civilian. But if you are a soldier in, in, in the German Wehrmacht, these are crimes punishable with death. So uh, you see a lot uh, of summary executions happening in the, uh, in the first uh, weeks of, uh, of the siege, uh, particularly. Um, what you also see is that, uh, as had happened in Ukraine, for example, and in Belarus, uh, these are not uh, sort of behind the scenes uh, executions. This is what you, for example, see in, in the movie. Uh, downfall, like like the famous movie about like the last days of Hitler, where it's uh, where they sort of indicate that a lot of this is done by scheming, bloodthirsty men, and of course this happened at times, but very often and in fact in Königsberg quite a lot more, it happens uh, it happens in the open, uh, cases are read out, uh, and this is all uh, known to everyone in uh, uh, in 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 the city. Um, now, of course, uh, not only martial law in Königsberg, but in the entire area of operations, which means that we see these uh, summary executions all throughout East Prussia and uh, throughout Germany, for that matter. What I would like to stress uh, is that not the entire uh, Germany is under martial law, but of course only the areas that are just behind the front lines. So this is also a big difference, uh, for that matter, with the First World War, when the entire country was put under martial law, this doesn't happen in the Second World War, which is also why for civilians, it's so much harder to, to adjust to it. Uh, so in 19, uh, 15 February, 1945, you have the quite famous or infamous decree on the establishment uh, of summary courts, which extends the right to execute German civilians uh, to, party, uh, to party members. Now there should be, no hint of a doubt that the um, that the party was heavily uh, inspired by the military. It, it flags it up literally in, in, the, in the preamble to the to the decree. It um, and uh, actually focuses on East Prussia. In East Prussia, you have a commander fighting by the name of Rendulic. Uh, he is um, he's quite. Uh, strict, uh, to put it mildly, so he executes hundreds, if not thousands uh, of soldiers under his, uh, under his command. Bormann, um, who, uh, like one of the highest party members, of course, uh, mentions uh, his admiration for this policy and uh, uses this uh, to, to pass this on to a Reich minister, uh, Otto Tirak, and says, we want something very, very similar. And this happens in mid-February. Now, this marks the uh, beginning of a true arbitrary violence. And in Königsberg, um, you're talking about 30 uh, people a day that are being executed. And these are just absolutely staggering numbers. So um, it amounts up to roughly uh, 1,500 
um, persons over the course of a, uh, of a two, two and a half month siege. So uh, here you see what uh, Mommsen has called cumulative radicalization. So uh, basically every faction, whether it's the party, whether it's the army, whether it's the SS, whether it's the police, there's a lot of um, uh, actors that are now uh, in their right to execute um, German civilians and they all uh, outdo themselves uh, in order to, uh, let's say, maintain order, but obviously <clears throat> and none of, uh, none of that necessarily happens. Now, some, uh, some conclusions. If there's one thing I would like to take uh, you to take away from, uh, from the talk is that, in my opinion, uh, I think a direct line should be drawn from the mass violence on the Eastern Front to the intra-ethnic uh, German versus German violence in, in Germany. So on the Eastern Front, uh, German soldiers had internalized the idea that their harsh stance towards uh, their direct environments uh, and the people living in it was justified. These men became morally numbed and they did not feel compromised in their uh, behavior. Uh, they did not feel uh, the need to change their day-to-day -day practices, which meant that although the skill and intent of the uh, destruction differ as they uh, move back to Germany. It is rooted in the same uh, behavioral patterns. Uh, it affected the people uh, they had sworn to defend. So during the fighting on home soil, the German population had to earn uh, the rights to be defended. And it meant that as early on the Eastern Front, human life was worth preciously little, resulting in uh, violent and inhumane policies that now targeted their fellow Germans. And I will leave it at that. Thank you, Boz. Thank you for that um, really fascinating lecture. Um, I just remind everybody, we are taking questions and comments via the chat and please feel free to, to send those to me. Um, if you, you may have something directly to Boz already, um, but I've also got one that's come in um, from Ed Westerman, whose work you referenced earlier um, about alcohol and genocide and obviously encapsulated very well in that image. Um, so Ed is also thanking you for a fascinating presentation um, and he's asked two questions so let's maybe start with the first one. Could you speak to the way in which this warped sense of military necessity which you described earlier affects actions taken by these men with regard to women? Um, so he's I think obviously the, the sort of gendered aspect to the violence yeah. and the second question um, relates to the photo with the caption referencing the 1940 film Jude Zeus. Um, which he says is an interesting manifestation of Nazi propaganda in the soldiers' own words. So can Sorry, you could, could, could you repeat that? Sure, I, sure. I, so, I, I think you... So the, yeah. the um, photo with the caption referencing Jude Zeus um, is, okay, an, yeah. is an interesting manif manifestation of Nazi propaganda in the soldiers' own words. So if you could speak to this phenomenon in more detail and its effect on radicalizing behavior. So two questions from Ed. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, with, uh, to start with, with the Yutsu's um, a picture, um, this I, I came across by, by chance, and this comes actually uh, from, a, from a police unit uh, operating in uh, Belarus. And um, what is incredibly interesting about this picture is uh, like it is part of a, a larger set uh, of them, where you first see a deep discrimination on, on, on page one of a of a photo album. And then the next page is quite literally what you see uh, later in, in the PowerPoint, that they now start uh, setting, uh, setting a light, uh, an entire village. So there is indeed this, uh, yeah, like the, the, the start of this dehumanization, uh, what you see uh, among uh, the men, this very deeply ingrained um, uh, yeah, attitudes like racist attitudes which on, on one hand uh, sees them indeed uh, like using this, let's file anti-Jewish uh, language and stereotypes and uh, which then results in, uh, yeah, like, like in this behavior, I, I think there's, there's, yeah, like as far as direct lines go, like to me that that was, yeah, like, like such a, like a shocking series of pictures because it's, it, it really, yeah, like it, it draws basically that, that direct line in that, in that behavior. And um, uh, your first question regarding the, the way that they behave towards women. 
uh, yeah, um, I think the, uh, the, the rape of, of Soviet uh, women uh, is, is becoming better and better and better known, of course. But if it comes to East Prussia, we tend to, of course, first look at the Red Army um, um, raping, uh, raping German women. So, yeah, women always have the yeah, short end of the, of the stick in, the, in that regard. Um, but you absolutely see that uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, um, in, in their attitudes. Like this also, uh, this absolutely uh, also continues in, in a very similar way. You have uh, soldiers referring to women in, in Königsberg as uh, Festungsbraute, so fortress brides. So they, they use basically the exact same uh, language. And if I may uh, use what I find to be like one of the most baffling uh, examples. And uh, I'd like to stress that this is an anecdote that as far as I know, has not been put into practice. But um, the German military uh, really fears because all these uh, uh, stories start to, to come in about uh, Red Army soldiers raping uh, German women. Now you think, let's evacuate the women. That would be a fair idea. But of course, you need those women in the defense of your city. So now here comes the idea of the, of the fortress command. And here you see how morally numb they are. They come up with the idea um, to uh, have all German soldiers um, have sex with German women so that once they are, when they are, would be raped by Soviet soldiers, at least they would already be pregnant of uh, racially pure uh, Germans. So like this is where their, their mind goes. So it is, it's, yeah, it's this completely perverted idea of, 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 of masculinity that, yeah, that, that completely, yeah, warps uh, all, all, all these, yeah, yeah, uh, behavioral patterns towards, uh, uh, towards women in this respect. And um, thank you for that. That's a, those are really full answers. Um, I'm just sorry, I was just thinking about what you just said. It's quite, it's quite um, interesting and, of course, disturbing. Um, yeah, very disturbing. Question uh, from David. Um, did the situation continue after the Allied occupation of Germany? So sort of what is the kind of temporal bounds around the, you know, the violence that you describe? Um, well, what you see, of, well, well, I cannot uh, speak obviously for, for the rest of Germany and, and East Prussia takes a very peculiar place here because um, it is immediately put under Russian administration and all um, German soldiers are, are, are taken prisoner, but also uh, most civilians. So basically all these behaviors are put to a stop basically immediately uh, by, uh, by the Red Army. This is not out of the kindness of their hearts, of course. This is because of, uh, uh, of, they, of the true need to uh, control what they consider to be sort of like the, the hornet's nests of, of, of Prussianism. So like, obviously also the, the Red Army has its fair deal of uh, like uh, um, uh, propaganda that is just as toxic, uh, but the other way around. So in, in East Prussia, that behavior doesn't uh, continue to, to, the same, uh, to the same extent. But what you do see and I think that flies a little bit under the radar, is that in 1946 and 1947, um, because the German military has basically just taken out everything out of East Prussia, um, there, uh, there cannot be, no, be, not be effective agriculture in the, in the province anymore. So all these defensive lines are made right through fields uh, farmers are being asked in 1944 already to um, uh, to help in the defense, so they cannot sow their uh, like their spring sowing, uh, all these things. Uh, so, like it, it is it, it is a famine waiting to happen, and it does happen. It happens in in in, uh, in 1946 and 1947 in the very same way as it happens in uh, as in the rest of the Soviet Union, because of course now. This area is, is part of the Soviet Union. So you see this massive famine uh, caused by the German military in, uh, yeah, like in the Western Soviet Union, in Belarus, of course, uh, uh, famously, and, and Ukraine. But this also extends into East Prussia, where uh, basically uh, the same things are happening. 
So I hope that answers. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. We have a question from Stephanie Rauch. Um, how does the violence in Königsberg compare with intra-ethnic violence elsewhere in Germany? And also, if I can add the question, why did you choose to focus on East Prussia? Uh, I, well, a lot of people tend to think that I must have family or something like that, but none of that actually. Uh, it's I always found the, the 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 Eastern Front interesting, just you know, as you know. Young young guys do, I guess, and uh, but I also uh, um, you know like growing up in the nineties, sort of like where there still was sort of like in nineteen ninety five, was like fifty years of liberation. I remember that very distinctly, and there was still very much the idea that like all Germans were were bad. Like obviously, uh, like also like like my grandmother's, like her brother never never returned, and just died hating hating the Germans. So um, uh, to me, this. But like I knew some Germans and I some I liked and I was like so so they cannot all be bad so I sort of like I ended up in the idea of like okay so I find Germany and and the Germans during the Second World War I find that interesting and I find the Eastern Front interesting so as a result I sort of ended up in, ended up in East Prussia there's nothing profound or um, familiar. Uh, to that so that is to 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 that's uh, part of the of the question uh well um um Königsberg and the, the area around Königsberg um is is particularly violent um it, it, it might be rifled by by Berlin um but but that's really about it so uh, fortunately um not everything was as violent as this Königsberg for every city where some executions happened. There's another uh, city where uh, there was only nominal resistance or where party officials sort of like let the front roll over them. Of course, you can still write in your local newspaper of the day, like, oh, we're going to defend. But if no one shows up and, you know, like wing, wing, notch, notch, we're, you know, we're just uh, hands up as, as quick as possible. Like th this is also understood. But of course you cannot communicate that. So you never know whether in your city there is, you know, like uh, if they are going to to defend or if they're just going to let the front wall over them. So I think <clears throat> as a result, we do have a little bit of a skewed idea of what's happening, especially sort of like in 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 Western Germany, where there is a lot of rhetoric of fighting to the last bullet or what have you. But push comes to shove, that doesn't really happen as much. Uh, obviously, in in Eastern Germany. Where there is the Red Army, that is really considered to be like almost zombie-like, uh, like in the way that we we think about zombies. Like you get bitten by a zombie and you're a zombie yourself. That is really almost uh, how uh, people in um, uh, uh, in in Eastern Germany I think, and I also feel that that is a very large reason why you see so many suicides, especially in 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 Eastern uh, uh, in Eastern uh, uh, Germany. Thank you. Um, a question from Mate. Was the Wehrmacht still trying to keep up a good image before civilians and order in its ranks towards Germans, or did they not have resources to, to uh, enforce this? Um, the, well, this, I, again, it depends, like, well, like, I know this is sort of like, a, like an academic answer, but like, it's, it depends on how you define like a good image. But, uh, um, uh, they, they think like they they like many of them felt they did because they were still uh, what they thought was a good image is that of a masculine uh, soldier fighting to to the last bullet that they thought that that is you know that is how you want to present yourself and that is what I am as a soldier. Um, a lot of civilians were uh, thinking and and saying also to them the exact opposite. Like, wouldn't it make more sense to uh, to surrender? Of course, and they like so and they said, oh yeah, but that is not. Yeah, like that, that is not what the what a German man does. So therefore I, I do not do I do that do not do that. So again, this uh, this can really differ at, at, at and uh, person to person. Like a Volkssturm um, man has this much less, of course, than a uh, uh, than a hardened veteran. Uh, but if you, for example, are a Reichsdeutsch, so uh, all of a sudden uh, quite a lot of Germans uh, 
remember that they were actually speaking a little bit of Polish or like maybe a little bit of Lithuanian or now uh, also felt like, oh, wait a minute, I'm actually Austrian. I am not even German. So, and, and these men would also uh, surrender a little bit uh, uh, earlier or so. Um, yeah, like I think what is just part of, of, of an army that's being defeated is that all these small peripheral things, they uh, like they become more uh, apparent. So you, you see a lot of more uh, infighting. So behind the scenes, you, you do see like it, it, it breaking down. But yeah, this is where keeping a brave face, this is, is how I would describe it. And whether that is good or bad, like that is that is for you to uh, uh, to, to decide how, how you want to yeah, to define it. Yeah. Thank you. And there's a question from Janice, uh, who also agreed that it was a fascinating talk. Um, and, and Janice is asking uh, a bit of a broader question about the difference between attitudes and behavior of the Wehrmacht and those of the SS. And obviously, you know, it's sort of hard to sort of lump, you know, kind of both of those <laughs> groups into uh, a single uh, sort of category. But um, if you could talk a bit in general terms of some of your about some of your observations yeah no i mean like this this really gets to to the core of, of what uh, uh of, of what is in, important and in german it's the difference between haltung and stimmung yeah? and uh like so the two uh to do a, a lot of commanders they say we don't care what you're Stimmung is like uh, like what 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 like, you know like uh, Scherner, one of the most hardened commanders. Like Stimmung is, is for when you walk in the park, and I am not at all concerned with your like like with your Stimmung. Like the only thing that I want is like how you are at, at the front. If you feel good at the front, uh, uh, all the better for you. But quite frankly, the only thing that we need is that you have a you know like like this this military attitude towards um, uh, just defending your own uh, position. And um, uh, yeah, like obviously, this this leads to massive internal uh, conflict uh, along a great many uh, soldiers. Yes, some see that the, uh, the defense of their home soil it, it, it gives them purpose that they feel they lacked on the uh, on the Eastern Front in the Soviet Union. The other hand, many see uh, just as many see it uh, like okay, we are now on the Eastern Front. Uh, oh, sorry, we are now back in in, in Germany. This is really just a sign that we're about to be defeated. So they can read the, uh, the, the same situation. They can read it completely, completely uh, different. But, uh, and yeah, again, commanders are very much, uh, much aware of that. And also just want to stress that um, uh, Stimmung, it's, it's, it, it's, it's not uh, that important. And, what I think, and this, the last thing that I will say about that uh, is that a lot of uh, soldiers uh, also, uh, in a way to square it, what they do is they say, okay, I might feel bad and my situation might be bad and this is why I'm feeling bad, but what do I know? I am only a soldier. I know that the high command and of course still Hitler was still has some uh, pool, of course, on, on the troops, of course, it gets much, much less but that they have my best interest at heart. So even if my direct environment uh, forces me to feel absolutely dreadful, uh, I have to assume that my, uh, my leaders have my, my best uh, interest at heart here. And uh, I cannot oversee the entire military uh, situation. I don't know what is happening around Budapest. Maybe it's going very well there. And um, uh, yeah, so, which is exactly the message they are, they are getting in, in, in in, in, in their newspapers, of course. So um, yeah, they're, they, they, they find a way to make uh, like their own sort of like daily um, uh, struggles, uh, care, like uh, just matter very little and just keep regurgitating that sort of like that, 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 that sense of like, like being a good upstanding soldier that defends his, it's his, his, his home territory because, you know, that's what everyone in, you, in, in the unit is saying is what everyone in the unit has been saying since forever. And that is what I'm therefore saying too. Thanks, Boz. Um, I think we've actually now just reached our, our time. So I wanted to say thank you for presenting your findings and for 
bringing your book to us. I've just put a link uh, to be able to purchase it in the chat. So hopefully everybody will check it out. Um, it's it's a it's a, such a rich topic and such a tremendous contribution to perpetrator studies and you know, sort of aftermath, sort of beginning of aftermath studies. It's, it, it's really, it was a really fascinating talk. So thank you very much. And of course, thank you to our audience and to everyone for their excellent questions. Um, thank, thank you for, for joining me. us this evening. And thank yeah. you. Thank you again. And have a good evening, everybody. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.